So good morning, everyone. We're here at the start of a new sermon series. For those of you who were here for our Easter service last week and came back, we thank you. And for those of you who were here and weren't, didn't come back this week, you know, let's go find them and bring them back. What do you think? Amen. All right. So this morning we're talking about the wisdom of Oz. And the Wizard of Oz is one of my favorite movies. Now, I have a lot of movies that I call my favorite movies. And so sometimes you'll hear me say, I was watching my favorite movie, and you might not know what I'm talking about. But for this week and this series, The Wizard of Oz is one of my favorite movies. And it's one that I catch at least two or three times a year, and I try and watch it all the way through. And the reason is because of what we're going for in this series, kind of finding God everywhere. That's really what we want to do. We want to be able to find God everywhere that we go. And it's funny how in something as simple as a movie like The Wizard of Oz, you can find the wisdom of God. Oh, I guess they're adjusting the lights because I said it was bright in my face. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. And we're going to be talking today about the Scarecrow, who is actually one of my favorite characters. Because if you've seen The Wizard of Oz, he all, his, his opening line is, if I only had a brain. That's his song. If I only had a brain. And he's really not stupid. He just wants a brain. He feels as though he needs to have that in order to be complete. And that's really what we do in life, isn't it? There's something that we think we need, something that we think is in, integral to our being, that if we had that, we would be complete. And each character in The Wizard of Oz had something that they thought or felt was missing. And for the scarecrow, it was his brain. And if you watch it all the way through to the end, the, the Wizard of Oz doesn't open his brain, his head up and put a brain in there. He gives him what? A diploma. And once he has that thing, then he feels as though he's smart and he starts talking and using really big words. But here's the thing. In terms of the wizard, the wisdom of God in the Wizard of Oz, you already have all those things. Everything that you think that you need to find God already gave it to you. And he said, all you have to do is seek me with all your heart and you'll find me. And when you focus on that, I'll add everything else unto you. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, it says, if you, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And that last part is the key, with all your heart. You want to make sure that when you're seeking God, you're seeking with all your heart. And that's what we're going to work on during this message series. In this one, the, the If I Only Had a Brain message, we're going to talk about how do you line up with God so that when you seek Him, you're really focused on the right thing. Because God is saying to you, don't go in a million different directions. Seek me, and I'll direct your path. In the movie The Wizard of Oz, everybody remembers the yellow brick road. It was a defined path that they had to follow to get where they were going. And God has done that. We don't always see it, but he's really laid out something, a path for us to follow. And so that's what we're going to do. Today we're taking that first step, lining our minds up with God. And I'm going to have three points, and my three points are going to have a, a bunch of scriptures and, and all these different things. What I want you to do, though, is while you're taking notes, and I hope you're taking notes, or if you're using the message handout, whatever you do, don't get lost in the writing and miss what God has to say. A very important part of sermons and coming to church to hear a message is to be ready and able to hear from God. So don't get lost in the paper and miss the presence. Okay? So point number one is accept God's timing. And I put this as point number one because this is one that really messes us up. Because a lot of times we are expecting God to follow our timing. God, I need this, and I need it now. Or God, I need it by the end of this month. Or God, I need it in the next few days. Or God, if you would bless me with this tomorrow. But the thing is, we've got to accept God's timing. And God's timing works in a couple of different ways. The first one, if you look in Jeremiah, and I'm going to try and stay in Jeremiah for the main points. In Jeremiah 29, verse 10, right in the same passage, it says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious <coughs> promise. 70 years, a defined time. He was telling his children, hey, guess what? 70 years, and I will come and fulfill the promise. 
Because imagine taken into captivity and put in a place of, of, of servitude. You're serving other people. You're serving people who don't believe what you believe. You believe in a certain God and they're telling you that, well, your God isn't real. You've now got to worship our God. And not only that, we, we're going to change your name. Your name might have been uh, the, the, the grace of God, your God, in your language. We're going to change your name and make it the grace of our God. And we're going to tell you that you are someone different. You're not anyone specific. You're not, you don't belong to your parents. You belong to us. And that's what they did to the Israelites when they went into captivity. They took them and changed them. But the one thing that the Israelites didn't give up, for the most part, was their focus on God. And that's what God said. In 70 years, I will fulfill my promise. So that tells them and gives them a defined end. It's kind of like when I get up here and preach, every time I preach, I say, if you don't know, go to the back of the book. At the back of the book, it tells you plainly, you win. We win. See, nobody ever cheers when I say that. Imagine if you knew what next week's lottery numbers would be. Would you cheer? Would you shout? Would you yell? Would you scream? If you knew, guaranteed that you'd win everything you tried, how excited would you be? Well, I'm telling you that through all the trials, through all the frustrations, through all the sin, through all the mess, through all the people, you will win. Amen. So this is how you do it. And the focus on God. The first thing is start early. You want to start early. Don't wait until you're in the middle of the mess to start focusing on God because it's hard to focus when you've got storms battering you on either side. And if you look in the Bible, there are many examples of people who started early. If we jump right at the very beginning of the Bible, in Abraham, in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, it says in verse 3, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. Go back and read it. Abraham had a promised son from God. And God said, through you, I will make a nation of people. I will make many nations. It will be like all the grains of sand on the beach. It will be like the number of children that are going to be in your lineage. And Abraham was an old man and his wife was old. And there was, in his mind, no way he could possibly have children. But here comes this God saying, this is what I'm going to do for you. And after he did it, after his son was born, after Isaac was there, and he could see him every day, God said, now take him and kill him. Take him to the mountain. Sacrifice him to me. Abraham didn't wait. He didn't talk it over with other people. He didn't organize a committee. He didn't, you know, get a letter writing campaign or start doing some surveys. Early the next morning, he went, saddled his donkey, and left. A three-day journey. Start early. The next one, so we take it from the beginning of the line to the fulfillment of the promise. Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. We all know the story of Joseph and Mary. Mary came to Joseph with an impossible story. She said, Joseph, I'm with child, and that child is from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph said, wait a minute. You're telling me that you're going to have a baby and I'm engaged to you and I know I haven't been with you? I have a problem with that. As I'm sure some of you would. Kind of hard to believe. And he was thinking, well, I, I love her so I don't want to just put her in front of the plaza for stoning and for scorn. So what I'll do is I'll put her away quietly and I'll just go on my life. And the angel came to him and said, no. Understand that God is doing this. He's doing a mighty thing in her life. And I want you to take her as your wife. Joseph didn't wait. He didn't get up and talk it over with his friends. He immediately woke up, went to Mary and said, I have heard from the Lord. And he said, take you as my wife. And I will. And off they went. The fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham through Isaac. Fulfilled because they started early. They didn't wait. They moved on quickly. If you notice from the Maximum Impact video we had earlier, Terry Bradshaw said he made his living down here, taking a hike and throwing a pass. How much time do you have, really? I mean, even with a good defense, you don't have a lot of time to make a decision. I get laughed at a lot, but I try and make 60-second decisions. 
Organize some questions. Make a decision. Don't wait. If God's calling you, what's the point? Why are you waiting? He's not going to go away. So the next one after starting early is be ready for change because that's probably the next thing after you've started early, there's going to be things that happen. God told Abraham, hey, go off and, 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 and go to this place I'm going to tell you about and you're going to have a son and he's going to be the father of many nations. And then he made him throw a curveball at him. Hey, take him into the mountains and kill him. But here's the thing. Abraham was ready for the change. He was ready because he had been focusing on God and lining himself up. And as we move through the Bible, there are all kinds of examples of people who were ready for change. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 2, we talk about the, 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 the apostles being in the, in the early church being in the upper room, waiting for God's time and saying, God, when are you going to send the Holy Spirit, you said to wait until that happened. And they were there and they were working and they were trying and they were waiting and they were waiting. And suddenly, suddenly, they weren't ready. They were in there praying and it was still sudden to them. That means it caught them off guard. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They weren't ready for it. Even in the midst of their prayers, they weren't ready for it. Suddenly it happened, and suddenly they began to speak in tongues, and suddenly the people all around them began to ask questions. Why are we hearing God's name proclaimed in this place? Why are we hearing it not only proclaimed in this place, but hearing it in our own tongue? These men are not men of knowledge. They're not learned men. They didn't go to school to study language. Why do we hear our native language? And they had to be ready for change. The, the apostles had to be ready for change. Because they had to be able to answer that question. And they said, hey, God has done this wonderful thing. And if you're focused on God, you can do that. You can shift. You can move with the way things happen. And in Acts chapter 6, verse 9, even moving further on, we have Stephen. And Stephen was the first deacon, one of the first deacons in the church. Now, Stephen wasn't called to be a pastor. He wasn't called to get up in front of a group of people and, and proclaim the gospel. He was called to help out, to work in the ministry, to help people, to make sure things were decent and in order. And then what happened? A curveball. Opposition arose, however, from the members of the synagogue of the freedmen. These men began to argue with Stephen. They didn't like him, and they didn't want him there. And they attacked him, and they, pro they, they, they took him before the courts, and they said, this man is, is this type of person. And, and what did he do? He was ready because he was focused on God. He was ready for change, and he spoke out boldly for God's glory. And we know how the story ended, but it doesn't make a difference. He was ready for the change. He was ready to fulfill his purpose. Because if there wasn't a Stephen, there wouldn't have been a Paul. Saul was there that day, and after leaving from the stoning of Stephen, he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And if it wasn't for that opening moment, would there have been a Paul? Paul wrote so many parts of our Bible that we read today. So much of the information that we use for our church is from Paul. But it's because Stephen was ready for change, and he didn't let turmoil and adversity change what he was doing. The next one is God is never late. Always remember that God is never late. I know it seems that way sometimes. It seems as though God is a little slow, and it seems as though he's, he's not moving at the pace that we want, but he's never late. And in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, it even tells us that. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. We understand slowness a certain way. We see God moving slowly a certain way. And we think that he's holding back from us. Oh God, we need it now. We need it now. We need it now. I'm whistling. I don't know why. But God, we need it now. We need things to be done and fixed now. But you know what God is doing? It's that last part. He's being patient with you. Patient with you so that nothing is lost. So that no person is left behind. He will not see anyone left behind. So don't expect God to move at your pace. You slow down or speed up to match with God. And if you can't do it in your own strength, which I'm going to let you know, you can't. Ask God for the strength to keep up with the vision he has for your life. So that moves us into point number two in your notes. 
Now, point number two in your notes is understanding God's plan. Because God does have a purpose and he does have a plan. In Jeremiah, back around our flagship scripture, 29.11, we, I mean, people say this almost to the point that it's become a trite phrase. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. You hear that a lot. You hear it on TV and TV ministries. I've even seen web pages where people use that as their, you know, kind of defining thing. But then their page is not about the Lord. And they use it. But it's true. Whether No matter how it's being used, the truth of God is the truth of God. No matter who's using it, it's still the truth of God. He has a plan for you. A plan to prosper you and a plan not to harm you. A plan to give you a hope for future. He's ready and willing to talk to you. All he asks that you do is just understand his plan. He asks you to talk to him about your vision, finding your vision. He says, I have something for you, but I'm not just going to throw it on you. What do we hear in verse 13? Seek me with all your heart. When you're seeking after God, he shows you the path that he has for you. He shows you the golden path to heaven. He shows you the golden path to your destiny. He shows you the golden path to God's success. And in Habakkuk 2.2, we see that. Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. Now, we don't have like modern day heralds. I mean, there's nobody like running up and down the street telling stories as they go along. Think of a billboard. The billboard is the modern day herald. When you're driving down the road and you see a billboard, you can't have, you know, three, four, five paragraphs there of description. Because you don't have time to read that. But a small, little, short billboard will capture your attention and change what you're thinking about. And that's what God is saying about your vision. Write it down and make it plain so that you can run with it and tell people quickly and they can understand and follow you. That's what Jesus did. He didn't come to the disciples and say, okay, guys, here's my, you know, three-year plan and it's, you know, 150 pages long and I want you guys to read through it and then get back to me and tell me what you think. He showed up by the side of the river and he said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And if you do that, you will capture people. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this out and take it away from, you know, we're talking about biblical times and, and bring it into today. In modern day times, I mean, for me, I used to be in the world of sales, okay? In sales, we had what was called the elevator speech. And the elevator speech was something you could deliver in an elevator. If you met somebody in an elevator and you needed to tell them exactly what you did, you had to be able to do it in the time it took you to go up two floors. And that gives you about 30 to 90 seconds. And in 30 to 90 seconds, you had to be able to explain to someone what you did and how you could bring benefit or add value to them in their business. And this was something that we did every day in the office. We would walk around, and when we weren't on the phone calling people or answering emails or doing whatever, we would walk up to somebody, tap them on the shoulder, and say, what's your elevator speech? What do you do? And you better be able to do it because it was your livelihood. And God say, do the same thing with me. You might not be an eloquent speaker. You might not be somebody who wants to get up on a Sunday morning and preach a sermon. But you can definitely impact somebody <coughs> close to you. And as I look out over this church and all the wonderful seats that we have here, I see a lot of empty spaces. So that's what we can do. We can find a way to fill these seats. Because that's the whole point. We blew out the walls and we moved the sound booth around and people were here painting and doing all these things because we wanted to fill the seats. And not because we wanted to say we're the biggest church in Maryland, but because we wanted to impact people's lives. So write down the vision. Make it plain. Explain it to someone and invite them. Because that's what God called us to do. In Matthew 28, verse 20, it says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Simple. You can deliver that in an elevator. You can tell people, this is what I do every day. Now, you don't have to go and try and find 100 people every day and make a bunch of contacts and try and lead them to Christ. But if you just did one, and that person did one, and that person did one, and that person did one, imagine how many people could be impacted if it continued to snowball that way. 
Just because you're focusing on God and you're doing the thing that he called you to do. You found your vision, you made it plain, and now you're running with it. And that's what God is calling us to do every day. And then you just take it one step at a time. Again, don't try and go out and reach 100 people tomorrow. If you've got the gift of evangelism, hey, go do it. Not everybody's called that way. But take it one step at a time. You might talk to just one person at your job. Or you talk, might talk to just one person at school. Or you might talk to one friend in the evening. Because believe me, one step leads to the next one. And leads to the next one. And Hebrews 11, 8, back to Abraham, it says, By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Abraham didn't know where he was going. God said, go. God said, here's the place. I'm going to show it to you. It's flowing with milk and honey. It's the greatest place you'll ever see. It is the place that I'm setting aside, not just for you, but for your entire legacy. For everything that I'm going to build you through you, this is the place that I've called them to. And Abraham said, okay, God, I don't know, but hey, I'm packing up. Uh, wife, people, animals, pack them up. We're gone. And early the next morning, they got up and They didn't wait around. Get moving, get moving, get moving, one step at a time. And as he went, God showed him more. God showed him more. God showed him more. My father in the ministry... His name is Brother Phillips from Houston. He used to make this joke in our men's meeting. And he would say, how many of you would like to be able to raise the dead? And, and of course, being a, a room full of men, and we're all tough men, and we're all tough in the Lord, yes, we want to be able to raise the dead. And he said, great. He said, the Bible tells you you will be able to do that. He says, you'll be able to do greater things than Christ did when he walked the earth. It says that for you. He said, however, how many of you are really ready for that? He said, if you walked into a funeral today, and you were going up to that body, and you said, arise, and then that body jumped up, stood bolt up right in the middle of the casket and said, thank you, what would happen? I'm not going to tell you what he said to a room full of men would happen if that happened, if you, that happened to you. But what he said was, you probably fall over and faint, or you die on the spot. <laughs> because you're not ready. You're not ready to just raise the dead. But are you ready to take that first step to believe in God that you can save a person who's on their way to eternal death? Can you talk to someone in your life and get them going? Then you will see the miracles of God. Then as you build your faith muscles and make it stronger in yourself, then you will be able to raise the dead. Are you ready for that? Could you do it? Could you take just one step at a time? Take one step tomorrow closer to the destiny God has for you. Take one step tomorrow towards the plan that you have for your life. Could you do it? And if you could, would you be able to think long term so that you can actually make those steps? That's the last part of understanding God's plan is thinking long term. You, you can't just focus on what you're going to do in the next 10 minutes. If that's all you ever do is think about the next 10 minutes, you're not going to get very far. But God is saying, I've got a long-term plan, a long-term vision, something that you can really sink your teeth into. He told Abraham that you will have children, as many as you see stars in the sky, that's how many descendants you'll have. Now, Abraham knows full well at his age, he's not going to be able to father that many children. And he knows that it's not going to last if he's the only one doing the work. So he knows that God's got something going on in his life. And as Abraham heard the promises of God, God gave him a longer and a longer and a longer term vision for what was going to happen to his children and how the coming Messiah was going to come through it and that he was going to see all these things. He wouldn't see them living here on this earth, but through his one step at a time, the long term vision would be achieved. And in Habakkuk 2.3, it says, For the revelation awaits an appointed time. Though it lingers, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. Think long term. Be prepared. Move forward. Listen to God. Understand his plan. Be ready for it. Because you don't know how many days you have on the earth. You don't know where God is taking you. And you don't know how long you have. You don't know how many more breaths you have. God has numbered your breaths. He's numbered your days. 
He knows. And he says, hey, you've got a plan, to, you've got something to fulfill. Get started. Start taking those steps. In Psalms 39, David cried out, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. And he didn't say that just, you know, just to say it. He says, God, tell me I've got 50 more years. Or God, tell me I've only got two more weeks. Because imagine what you would do if God came to you today and said, you only have one more year. And this is what you're, this is what I've called you to do. And you only have one more year to fulfill it. How many of you would get up the next day and go to work? Maybe that's your calling is for you to go to work and become some great person of business. But really, in theory, I mean, because in here in America, people don't work because they're called to their jobs. They work a lot of times because they need to pay bills. So if you knew that God had a plan for you and he had a hope for a future for you, and he said, and that hope for a future is only here on earth for another year, what would you do? How would you change? What would you do differently in life? Who would you talk to tomorrow if you knew that by the end of the day tomorrow, that was it? You weren't going to be here. I know for me, I've got little kids. What would I tell my daughters that was important for them to know or prepare something for them so that they could know the wisdom that God has given to me to pass on to them if I didn't have the time? You've got to think long term. Prepare now so that you can take those steps, those everyday steps, and really touch the lives of people in this area, in this planet. You might not be able to fly all over the world, but you might be able to touch the person who can fly all over the world. Or touch the person who might just go next door. And touch the person who might go to the next county over. Think about it. Think long term. Prepare for what God's plan is. And lastly, learn God's way. Learn his way. God has a certain way that he does things. And certain attributes of God. His names are his attributes. We really want to learn his way. And in this whole passage, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14, we've seen a lot of what God does. And how his way translates into actual work that he does. In Jeremiah 29, 14, the last one in, 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 in this little passage that we're working with for this series. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you. God has a place for us. And he has a home for us. He has something that he's going to do that is amazing. And when the appointed time comes, God's going to show up and he's going to do something awesome. And during the time before he shows up, you're going to do something awesome for him. So let's think about it. Learn his way. The first thing you can do and the first thing that he does is protect what you love. And he always protects what he loves. He started in the book of Genesis saying in chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work, to work it and take care of it. The Garden of Eden was not just a place for God to place man because he didn't have anywhere else to put him. He put him there. That was a protecting place. That was a cloistered place. That was a place where God could come and be with his favored creation. And if you don't think that you're a favored creation, go to the beginning and read what God said about creating man. And don't think man, think woman, think all of us. And if he had such a great love, he, he's going to protect you. If he's got such an awesome plan, he's going to protect you to fulfill that plan. And you've also got to protect the things that you love. If you love God and you love the plan that he's given you and the vision that he's given you, you've got to protect it. There are certain things that you've got to keep clear from your mind. See, the thing is, in America and even in the world, there's so many distractions. I have a friend that uses the, uses the phrase octopus on roller skates. And he says a lot of people are like that. Think about it, an octopus on roller skates. And he says, a blur, of a blur of activity and no direction. You're spinning, 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 spinning. You might even be spinning in a direction. But where are you really going? And how can you impact somebody else if all you're doing is spinning around, changing your mind all the time? How are you going to do it? Protect what you love. Protect your plan. Protect your family. Protect your life. There are certain things that we just should not be involved in. 
And, and I don't say that as an accusatory thing, like I'm pointing at someone and saying, don't sin, because I'm a sinner. I am a sinner. I have made mistakes. I have done things wrong. And not just in my previous life before I was saved, I've done wrong things after I've been saved. I've even done wrong things after I started getting up here and preaching. But I understand that every day I'm taking one step closer to what God wants me to do. And every day I'm taking one step closer to protecting that which God says he loves. Protecting myself, protecting my mind. Because out of your mind is what's going to come out of your mouth. What comes out of your mouth is going to translate into the things that you do. And when people see the things that you do, you're either going to be an example or a warning for people's lives. I mean, it, it's so very clear. In, in, in this world, in the Bible, in this world, in your life, in your circle of friends, there are people you consider to be examples and warnings. People you want to follow after and people you want to not do what they did. And by protecting what you love, you can be the example and not the warning. You've also got to prepare for trials. Because God is letting you know that it's not going to be an easy road. Does anybody think that Jesus' road was easy? I mean, we sat here through seven weeks of the Passion. And we saw what he went through and the agony of his last days here on earth. It was not an easy road for him to walk. And that's just in the last few days before his resurrection. Let's go back and talk about when he was 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. Let's talk about when he's meeting these demon-possessed people. Those are not easy days. Let's talk about when the, the, the members of his, of his church, the people whom God said, you are coming for these people, when at every turn they were trying to drive him out and trying to run him away. It's not easy. And God said in, in John 15, verse 20, Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. This world is not made to coddle us. It seems that way sometimes here in the United States because we are quote-unquote a Christian nation. But let me tell you something. Things are changing. If you haven't noticed it, it's changing. And, that, and yes, we might have it easier than, say, Bishop Solomon in Pakistan or the, aid, the believers in, in Korea and in China. But believe me, persecution is coming if it's not already here. And we need to be prepared for that. What are you going to say when somebody says that your God is, 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 is a joke? What are you going to say when you run up against uh, some of the folks that I deal with on the internet that say that your God is, is, is false and I'm going to put a video up and, and blaspheme God and say that there's no Holy Spirit. What are you going to say to those people? When they come to you and they want to embarrass you in front of folks because you're not ready to answer their question or you're not ready to hear from God. Your focus has not been on God. Your mind is not right. So when they come to you and they ask you, hey, I was reading in the scripture, and it seems as though, and, and believe me, they do read our scriptures, and they, this seems to contradict that. Are you ready for that? I had some, um, some of the guys from Houston, they went down to Trinidad. And while they were in Trinidad, there was a show that was on the, the, the satellite television they were watching. And it was, a, it was a, a Muslim show, a show about Islam. And what they did is they actually brought weak Christians on the show. And then you have a Muslim scholar there, and the Muslim scholar is refuting the Bible to the Christian. And the Christian has no argument. He's not ready for that. And so the people who are around are like, well, am I really going to follow after this Christ? You're not even sure what he, what he believes. You're not even sure about your own word. But this guy who says that he believes something else knows yours and his. Are you prepared for the trials? Are you focusing in on God? Are you getting your mind right? Because when you do that, you can take that step. You're ready when you get slapped in the face with things. You know, because you're not always going to have all the answers. You can't possibly have all the answers. But you know when it hits you face to face, to stop, 
Seek after God with all your heart and say, God, here I am in this situation. I know that I might not have studied every available thing that I could have, but God, you've got the answer. Let me have the answer so your glory will be shown. But if you're focused on your own embarrassment and not having studied that morning, or the fact that you haven't prayed for the last week or the last month, or you haven't been to church since last Easter or 2007, I mean, you're, if you're focused on that, you can't focus on what God's doing. You can't focus on, on, on what God has for you to answer. So do that. Prepare for the trials. And lastly, find God everywhere. God is everywhere. There is no place that you can go that God isn't there, that God isn't doing something in that place. Now, mind you, there are probably some places we shouldn't go, but that doesn't mean that God isn't doing something in that place. And that's why I love this series, The Wisdom of Oz, because God is everywhere. He's everywhere. Even to the people that say, well, what if God, God's never been to some of these remote places and there have been no missionaries there, but the very creation cries out to God. Everything about what God has created shows his glory. And believe me, even when we don't have anything to say, the very thing that God created cries out. In Luke 19, verse 40, it says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Because that's what happened. The very stones that God created, the, the rainbow, the clouds, the sunset, the stars in the sky, the fact that you don't have to think, beat heart, beat heart, beat heart, beat heart. The fact that you don't have to remind yourself to breathe. The fact that you don't have to remind your blood to flow. Cries out that God is awesome. Cries out that he's everywhere. Cries out that he's in the details. So focus in on him. Get your mind right with God. Find him everywhere. Because he truly is in every place and every one. He is so awesome and so mighty that if you fill this place up, he would still be able to do his work. If there's one person here or there's a thousand people in this church, God is so great that he can work with that. And he can work with you individually and everybody else at the same time. He can meet your individual need while meeting the needs of every other person on the planet. And he is not diminished in any way. So the last thing I have for you this morning, and it's not in the PowerPoint or anything else. It's something that Pastor Paul talked about this week. And now I can move because there's no more PowerPoint and I'm not going to be like in the screen. There's two types of time, and we talked about time earlier today. And I'm probably going to get the words wrong, but the first one is chronos, the second one is kiros, and I'm hoping I got that right. And here's the thing. Chronos time is what we already know. We know timeline from the year you were born until the year you die, or from the, at the beginning of the United States until today, or from the beginning of time to the end of time. That's chronos time. It's linear time. And then the second time is kiros time. That's the perfect time of God. The time when the God's purpose is fulfilled in a specific point. And I hope that someday I'll be able to preach a message on the power of now because God has already, God exists in a different way than we do. We see everything as a progression from start to finish. And God sees everything all at once. And that's how that kiros time works. There is a moment in everybody's life, and there's a series of moments where the Holy Spirit comes in and he crosses right in your, your timeline. And he crosses right in there at a specific point. Because this is the perfect moment for God to do what he did. This is the perfect moment for God to move in your life. This is the perfect moment for God to bless you or change you in a dramatic way. And we heard about a perfect time last week. God came in from the beginning of time as we know it to the end of time. And he said, this is the perfect moment and created that Kiros moment in God's death and in God's resurrection. And God wants to do that in your life. He's got a Kiros moment for you. If you don't know God, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, this could be the moment. I don't know. I am not the Holy Spirit. But you know what's going on inside of you right now. And if this is your moment, if this is your Kiros time, you better be ready. Because it's going to happen. 
And God is there for you. Be ready for your now moment. Be ready when God shows up. Whether it's now to be saved, whether it's now to get your life back on track, whether it's now to reconcile with the spouse or to reconcile with children or to, to apologize to that person who was in your life that you wronged or to forgive the person who did wrong to you. There is a moment where God is going to come together in your life. Are you ready for that moment? Let's stand right now and let's talk to God about that now moment. Let's talk to him about what he is going to do. And, and you guys can come on up to worship team. And that now moment, it's your time. It's your time to hear from God. You should have been hearing from him the entire time we've been here, but believe me, he's talking right now. If you would but quiet yourself and listen, he would be there to talk to you. So don't listen for the, the loud, booming voice. Listen for the stillness. Listen for God to, to work in your spirit. So let's go ahead and stand and let's get ready to pray. Because we love to hear from God. If you don't, learn to love to hear from God. Because God loves to talk to you. And believe me, if God wants to talk to me, I want to listen. Because sometimes I don't think I want people to hear what I have to say. Because sometimes I think I'm a little bit crazy. I don't know about you, we all have stuff, but God wants to talk to you, and he wants to talk to you right now. So Father, we thank you for this time that we've had with you this morning. We thank you, God, for the now moment that you've created. We thank you, God, for a life lived. We thank you, God, for a life lived along your path. We thank you, God, for a life being redirected towards your path. And God, right now, if there be anyone here who wants to call on you and call you Lord, let them do it now, God. Let them open their hearts and receive you. It's so very simple. All they have to do is recognize that they're a sinner, recognize that through that sin they are separated from God, and recognize that through the blood of Christ they can be reconnected. That their long line of being out of place can be straightened immediately. And they can be put on the path back to you. And they can have a divine connection with you, God. So God, touch them right now. For the rest of us, God. For those of us who call ourselves your children. For the rest of us, God, who are here today. And potentially gone tomorrow, God, we thank you for everything that you've done in our lives up until this moment. And God, we thank you for the plan that you said you had for us, the plan to prosper us and not to harm us, God, the plan for a hoped future, a hoped future, God, a future that we hope and that we know, God, because you told us that we are in the winning position. So God, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for loving us. And God, all we can do is thank you. Because, God, no matter how much time we take on a Sunday, we can't possibly thank you enough. We cannot outgive to you. So, God, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.